I'm excited to talk about how TCNA, which is Toyota Connected North America, was able to shift gears and leverage CNCF tools to streamline our operations. My name is Benson Phillips. I'm located in Austin, Texas. Toyota Connected is in Plano, and I've been there uh, close, coming up on three years or so. And I'm Rob Heckel. I'm an engineer with Toyota Connected as well. Um, I'm based out of Houston, but obviously we, we report into Plano. Um, I've been with TC for approximately two years now, a little over two years. And uh, my favorite open source project is probably CERT Manager. So, yeah. Cool. So a little bit about Toyota Connected itself. Uh, it was founded in 2016 with the goal to transform Toyota from an automotive company into a mobility company through connected and intelligent services. So we provide services such as like the SOS button in the top of your car, the head unit info, info, main, infotainment system, the AI voice assistant, as well as various other data-oriented services. Um, Toyota Connected is split into four separate major departments, uh, and each of these departments are highly autonomous. Um, they have their own DevOps team, they have their own patterns and ways of doing things. Um, and this worked when the company was smaller. Uh, they were able to rapidly develop and kind of go their own directions as they needed to. But as we're growing, we have started to face different challenges and inefficiencies, uh, you know, continuing with that same model. So, so a couple of these organizational challenges is collaboration. Um, there is limited inner sourcing and there was a need to foster collaboration so that way um, teams you know, can keep a lot of their autonomy, but at the same time are able to reach out to a central team and utilize the patterns and different standards that we're able to set up. Um, this also brings in responsibility and context where uh, it's not necessarily, there's no like set, or there wasn't any set in place responsibility pattern. Um, because everyone was so, was so segregated and split apart, um, there wasn't really a standard or uh, idea in place for who do I go to when I need something, or who's an expert on, say, a certain tool, or what teams are even doing things. So this brings into context where if I don't really know what these other departments are doing or the cool stuff that they have that I might also be trying to implement, um, it's hard to, or it just, it just results in a lot of repeat work where each of these departments are doing the exact same thing and they're not collaborating, kind of just slowing things down. Uh, and then another big part is change. So change in general is hard, especially when you have a lot of control. Um, there can be fear around not wanting to lose um, control over the stuff you own and giving it or granting or working with another kind of more centralized team within the company. So some technical challenges we faced is a lot of add-on and tooling sprawl. So there's a lot of redundant dependency management. We're all using a lot of the exact same tools. Each time, say, an upgrade comes out, we have to go check out the deprecations. Each individual team is doing it on their own instead of just having you know, one central chain looking at that stuff. Another issue is there's plenty of templates and patterns throughout all these teams, but they're, they were super team specific, super niche to the teams and very hard to share across, uh, across team, cross department. Uh, and the other big thing is management. There really wasn't any sort of central control plan or central manage um, ability across these teams. But like I said, a big part of it and, and a big cultural shift as well is we did want to maintain as much autonomy and self-service that these teams could keep so they could keep going on um, as they did in the past um, and really just us provide them as many benefits as we can uh, without essentially taking over or like forcing anybody to conform to a certain standard or certain way of doing things. So, the vision we had in mind. We want a unified place for be people to reach out, see documentation, and collaborate across teams. Standardized developer workflows. Empower these developers for self-service deployments, um, allowing them to, like I said, rem re remain as autonomous as possible. Easily onboard new developers, and more visibility into the health and life cycle of things, especially like I said, cross-department. And so what came out of this is Maestro. So Maestro isn't just a developer platform. It really is kind of a whole ecosystem. So the two main drivers are Backstage and Argo, which we adopted, um, as well as all these other pieces that fit in to make it work. So I'll start off with Argo and uh, the biggest 
thing with Argo is, so two teams were actively using Argo, or two departments, and, uh, but in completely different ways. They had completely different standards, way of deploying things, um, and then two of the other teams weren't using Argo at all, weren't really familiar with it. So we took it upon ourselves to try to align everybody in this central way. So there's 69 clusters deployed across these four departments, um, and so we wanted a flexible way to manage these clusters. There are 48 add-ons, or like third-party tools, that are deployed across these clusters, and 22 of them are shared between teams. So at least 22, at least two of the teams are using the exact same tool, but are deploying it, like I said, in a completely different way, um, either through Argo or just other deployment methods. And then six of those tools are redundant. So when I say redundant, I mean, so things like there's four different types of ingress controllers. Is it the case that uh, we really need the specific feature of this ingress controller, or are we actually able to bring more alignment and just kind of set on one for the company and develop a pattern around that? Uh, same thing for, say, like Carpenter and uh, Cluster Autoscaler was another one. Every team was using something different. Is Can we just align and actually use the exact same thing? Um, and then, like I said, multiple deployment patterns and usage. So, in order to have more of a flexible um, central management, like I mentioned, keep teams autonomous, we kind of depended on this repository and deployment structure. We use the Argo CD, Argo CD uh, app deployment or app of apps deployment method, and we have a central shared Git repository. And what exists in the, this, this Git repository are a lot of things like shared tools. Um, we're trying to do cluster bootstrapping within it. Um, and if you see on the actual or the color of each of these folders. Um, in the shared repository, it's half green, half blue, or half blue and half red. Um, the individual departments still do have co-ownership over these individual folders in the repos. So say if something goes down and the central team, you know, maybe isn't able to respond fast enough and these teams do want to maintain fully autonomous, they can come in, modify this repo, fix anything that breaks, anything that changes, uh, if it comes down to that or if that's necessary. But during the good times when nothing's going down, uh, nothing's going offline. Uh, the central team is just managing that fully. They don't have to focus at all on these uh, specific tools, and they can really just continue working on the things that differentiate them as individual departments. Um, the other piece to this is they each have their own individual Git repository. So during our entire migration process, like I said, we didn't really necessarily force anybody into a certain pattern. So we we're able to use the app of apps method and link up to their existing Argo CD app deployment repos. Um, so from their perspective, whenever we onboarded the new multi-cluster or multi-tenant uh, Argo instance, all we had to do after setting up this shared repository is just point it to their existing repository and more or less onboard them instantly. Um, and along with that came other standards and things like that. Another thing I will mention is the Argo CD sharding feature. There was a concern um, from teams um, that some team might deploy something broken, some, somehow mess something up, and it would cause, say, a runaway pod or some sort of situation. And there was a fear around uh, affecting other teams that have highly critical deployments. So we're using the sharding method to keep that separation even, uh, even you know, further separated, so that way there is a, a pretty good limit on the type of damage or the amount of damage you could do in a worst, worst case scenario. Um, then as you can see here, they're, they're able to deploy directly to their own individual clusters. Uh, another, another big part about this regarding collaboration is you can only write so much documentation and you can only read so much documentation. So if you set up tons and tons of patterns and it's all just documented places, um, it, it's, there's, a, there's a certain extent of its use. But when you have a central location where developers can go in and actually see the code and work, uh, be actually just, you know, maybe need to copy it over to their own repository, real life examples of it actively working, it makes it much easier for developers to fall in line and um, just adopt these patterns. Because it's right there in front of you. I don't have to go through documentation and read everything. I can just copy it over or see real world examples of things being deployed. Um, one thing I will also mention is the CE team, the central team, we actively use the shared Git repository. We, we don't have a separate, uh, you know, department A GitHub repository. We also use this one for the rest of our stuff. So if there's a team that's looking to deploy something new, a new tool, um, they can look in and see our non-shared tools or our own individual custom deployments, 
and be able to copy those as needed. And this is part of a push just in general of trying to make things as open as possible, trying to make things throughout our entire um, Git instance just read only. So if there is, is an interest from one team to another to say uh, this, this team is having uh, maybe deploying something new or a new insight, Previously, there was no ability to like kind of feed that curiosity of other developers. If they're win willing to spend the time to go check things out, if that's not enabled, um, it just kind of stifles collaboration and innovation and slows things down. So within the shared Git repository, uh, it's really about dependency management and bootstrapping. So like I mentioned earlier, we have lots of shared tools um, between clusters, shared between teams, and say there's a deprecation, there's not a huge need or it's a lot of redundant work for everybody to go through and um, do, the, do the exact same work to upgrade something. So by, by having these shared tools within the central repository, uh, we are able to go through and um, deploy things for them. So it can be the last thing on their mind and they can focus, like I said, on what uh, differentiates, differentiates, differentiates their team. Um, along with this is, so I'll just call a couple of these out. Um, external secrets and open cost. Open cost is big, big regarding um, just more of that view. So it's multi-tenant and teams can go in and just look at and check out the cost on other clusters and see what's going on, see if there's any improvements that can be made. Another big one is we implemented Argo rollouts for one of our teams that uh, just didn't have any sort of uh, blue-green deployment or canary deployments at the time, and it was adopted pretty fast. And especially because Argo rollouts integrates very well with the whole Argo ecosystem. It makes sense to just pop it into this central repository and central deployment and uh, have, you know, easily able to deploy it to any other team that might need it or utilize it. So the three other kind of major tools that were adopted and put into use was external secrets operator. Um, each team was doing a different way of deploying secrets to their cluster. Um, some teams, like if you remember the uh, Argo CD has like the vault plugin, a team was using that. So we wanted to standardize on external secrets. Um, this brought a ton of alignment on just how we manage it in general. And recently we had to move secrets to providers. So this allowed us to really um, just make that process super seamless. So as part of the migration into Argo or the central instance, we deployed external secrets. And then maybe six months later, it found out that we need to move secret providers. So it really lined up perfectly and made that transition seamless. Uh, just like in the way we were able to point or go at a new cluster and just transition teams as easy as possible. Um, another thing I'll mention on that is you can make the best tool ever, the coolest thing it does, it has all the bells and whistles, but if it's hard to understand or hard to actually implement, no one's gonna go out to do it. No one is gonna take the time to go out of their busy schedule on the things that are focused and really important to their team to just go and adopt something that uh, maybe a central team is forcing it on them or no matter how cool it is without forcing it on them, if it's not easy for them to implement, then uh, the, the interest won't be there. The other big tool is Harbor. Uh, like I said, we had a bunch of different ways of doing this as well, using our uh, using GitLab or ECR, and so we wanted a central place to align. So this is kind of in progress. We're hoping to um, continue this and get more adoption from other teams, um, but especially the pull through cache feature, there's a lot of custom implementations in order to make that a reality, custom just scripts and bots that each team had, um, but Harbor made it easy to enable that essentially out of the box. And then, like I mentioned about open cost, uh, a lot of cost transparency just across the clusters. Like we just want things, you know, fully open, visible to everybody. If there is an interest, allow that interest to kind of flourish and allow dev developers to go across and figure things out for themselves. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on over to Rob. All right. Thank you, Benson. <clears throat> and now the next big tool that we implemented um, was not, there we go, thanks. Um, backstage, right? And so backstage, it's not just a tool, it's an enabler um, that helps us align technically and culturally. Um, it certainly opens up transparency between teams um, and creates that bridge uh, that helps open up shared responsibility. Um, how many people here have heard the terms people, processes, and technology, right? Yeah, it's pretty ubiquitous in the industry, right? Um, how many people here have heard of socio-technical systems? 
Okay, a couple of you, that's awesome. Um, so that just kind of takes people, processes, and technology and each of those different networks a little bit further where we're starting to talk more about goals and culture and how these all interact and enable one another, right? Um, and so that's actually a very old term. It's from the 1950s. Um, researchers at Tavistock Institute in London, um, it's actually from optimizing coal mines, right? And so it's amazing how these different theories come back um, around 100 years later or so, right? Um, same way with like Conway's laws, right? Um, organizations build things that, um, that how their communication channels operate. So um, Backstage really helps us focus on the human-centered development. And so that still allows for autonomy for teams, but it also opens up the transparency. Um, it uh, also helps with collaboration improvements because of self-service, and uh, it really has enabled our cultural shift. And so tuning the orchestra, right? When we all started this implementation, we had no engineers that had experience with TypeScript or Node.js. Like, None, right? And so everybody opened up the books. We started typing in our consoles. And next thing you know, we're not specialists at it, but we're quite good at it now. Um, moving along, we all, when we came together for this, we came with assorted backgrounds. So we had our product owners, um, we had our managers in with us, but we also had our portal developers. And then we brought in DevOps engineers who were really heavy in the infrastructure background. Right, so we could start having those conversations around what is hard and what is painful for developers and what is hard and what is painful for infrastructure engineers. And so really bringing the DevOps thing together. Um, moving on. And we did have to fill the gaps, right? So we had to work with our partners. Thank you to anybody who watches this or who may be here. Um, also, we brought in external entities to help us out with, uh, you know, Node.js architects and uh, TypeScript architects. Um, and so that helped drive our team and increase our education as well. And then finally, we had to move into like rapid prototyping. Historically, we're working in Scrum, we're working in Agile. We have a little bit of breathing room to go back and reflect on the things that we were building. Um, we were under, operating under a pretty tight time window. And so we went with rapid prototyping for this, where our lead time to changes and how we were implementing and reviewing things uh, stopped being weeks and we started coming into like hours. Uh, you know, developers talking to infrastructure engineers saying, does this work, does this work? How's it look, product owner? Like, everybody cool with this? Great, leave it. So um, that's how we kind of rapidly developed our platform. And so you can begin to see this and I get asked this question all the time. Um, this is a tool called Gorse, and so it's like source, but it starts with a G, right? Um, you can do this with any Git repo, but you can really start to see where we begin adopting things like cross-plane to deploy our infrastructure. Um, Argo CD starts working in there. Um, generally, we try to keep with all of our community plugins, um, but there are times when you have to build custom plugins, right? So we're building custom plugins in this graph, um, additionally, yeah, just like I said, the Argo CD and cross-plane, um, yeah. And so our developers were operating under with some ground rules. Um, we wanted to keep things open source first. Um, we wanted to avoid, it, it, because it's an easy trap to get into, right? Fork the thing, make the change, get your immediate gratification and move on. Don't do that, right? Uh, it just turns into more pain down the line. That's more you have to maintain. Um, we also wanted to think modular, right? So we weren't just thinking about systems, but we were also thinking about our teams and how can we design different aspects of the system to be modular enough that we can adapt them to each team's specializations, as Benson alluded to. Um, additionally, we started like with Backstage. Is there already a plugin for that? Um, if not, can we build one and contribute it to the community? Or can we adapt one to suit our needs and put those changes back into the community, right? And so um, the final topic was really giving back. We wanted to start contributing back into the open source, and that was something relatively new inside of Toyota Connected. Um, one of our engineers, the software developer, once he had his first M or not MR pull request merged into um, the Backstage community plugins, he, he expressed such gratitude just for being connected to something bigger. 
you know, you, your changes effectively are going into tons of other people's operations and their data centers, their clouds, right? And so, um, you know, we focus on an ikigai at uh, Toyota Connected. And so loosely translated, it's going to be like life and value. And so, um, like, the thing that wakes you get up in the morning and you're happy about and what drives you. And so, like, my ikigai has always been developer enablement. I just want devs to be able to do things as efficient as they possibly can, not have to worry about complicated tasks. I don't want to play that again. All right. Self-service, right? And so um, we wanted a highly autonomous uh, environment. Uh, all of our different teams require self-service capabilities. Um, we wanted to commoditize the software development life cycle as much as possible within the organization. Um, we're all using the same things. There's no reason we should be using them differently, right? And so, like automotives, right, there's the concept of shared platform in vehicles. So you have a Camry, and then you have a Lexus ES, right? For the most part, they're 90% the same thing, right? So you don't have to worry about it. Differentiation comes in the form of the uh, things like the leather that you put on it, the, the wood steering wheel, right? And so by commoditizing the basics, we make those really bolstered and things just kind of work. And so that enables us to reduce our cognitive load and our development team's cognitive load, right? And so that turns the focus into innovation and differentiation within the organization. You'll see a number of different things on here, and I'm sure uh, you all have some of the same pain points, right? Onboarding a new engineer. What team does, are they going to? What security groups do they need to be in? What tools do they need? How do they set up? How do they get access to different cloud accounts, right? It's, uh, you know, these are things that w came to us as problems on day one, and we were able to quickly develop solutions um, with little to no out-of-the-box changes. Um, Moving right along. And so what's the culmination of all of this, right? You've seen what Benson presented, all sorts of Argo and uh, every different, you know, CNCF tool under the sun. So we made a scaffolder and we made it for a new Python project. You know, love it or hate it, like everybody just kind of falls back on Python is what we've seen. So <clears throat> we simplified the field selections, right? From my ITSM days, if somebody is going to open a ticket to you, you can ask them a thousand questions. If you have all those fields answered, you can then automate the process and this, that, and the other, right? And that's great. People don't want to fill that out, right? So um, you, you want to give them like the basics. Don't overcomplicate things. Um, so when they submit this form, what they end up getting is a shared Git repository, right? They get an application repo. We got um, Python code that you know, fires up a Flask app, and you get a new web application. Um, included in that is the Argo CD configuration. You have your CI CD configuration. You have open tofu when and where necessary. Moving right along, you have your Argo CD onboarded already. Um, you have your images being published out into Harbor, and so you're getting your security scans there as well. Um, you're automatically deployed out into our EKS clusters in AWS. And yeah, so what do we handle? We handle your ingress controller. We're taking advantage of external DNS, right? Um, Route 53, automatic records. And the, you know, you can run all this by hand. You know, kubectl apply, Helm charts, all that fun stuff. But every engineer in your organization isn't gonna have that level of t uh, knowledge or desire to learn that, right? Don't force the devs to learn infrastructure things, right? Um, and then we also have Cert Manager, obviously. You heard me say it was like one of my favorite tools. Saves so much time. We don't have outages anymore because somebody forgot to update the Cert. Um, we also have uh, ESO enabled. So we have automatically have the access to secrets and the ability to use secrets in the future as well. Um, and then we have our Prometheus and open costs. So you're able to see what your workload looks like, how much it costs, and um, you know, we also put other observability tools on for them as well. And then finally, this is your website. So um, that's the first thing you get. You know, Rob's web app, Robco, I like to use that one all the time. Um, you're able to access that within, I don't know, two minutes, three minutes from the time they hit submit. And they're just taken to that website, right? And so then they have an application repository that they can go modify as needed and just start 
you know, hammering away without needing too, too much um, technical experience as well, right? Um, and so what were our outcomes, right? Um, one of the more interesting ones was an OSPO, Open Source Program Office. And so that was designed to, or came together to meet the growing needs of security and compliance. Um, one of the cool outcomes about that was it was also like a golden path, so to speak. You know, I, I don't want to crush these terms with golden path, paved paths, but um, it was a golden path to being able to contribute into new open source repositories, right? They go in, they set, you submit it, they say, okay, does it have this license? Does it have that license? How does it impact our business? Do, do, we, do we increase any risk by using this or contributing to it? No, right? And so within a couple of days, generally, we're able to say, cool, go out there, build your app, um, submit a plugin to the community plugins, so on and so forth. Um, so that's been great. Um, additionally, increased collaboration. So we've had Maestro, um, is <laughs> just kind of the name starts showing up everywhere in merge requests, inside of Slack, um, you know, what, what have you. And so every, it gets everybody talking, right? Since everybody's kind of laying their best practices out on the table for the entire organization of you, it makes us able to say, well, you know, that's not the way I would have done it, but maybe that's better than the way I would have done it. And so I would rather take the time to adopt that shared pattern and maybe even contribute back into that shared pattern, right? Um, and <laughs> before those patterns start becoming shared, we have our ADR processes and RFC processes. And so this was just um, another thing that we didn't have in place before we brought our um, IDP or uh, developer portal and platform as a whole um, into the organization. Um, also, inner sourcing, right? Uh, as we were pretty siloed, there wasn't a lot of collaboration between teams, and there are a lot of shared problems that we have. Um, some different things are like Kubernetes update checks, right? And so those are different tools that we're uh, working on together since we're all using Kubernetes. And so why not look at the things like, oh, what APIs are going uh, deprecated next version? What, which of my apps are impacted by this? Can we get this thing to the point where it will automatically upgrade our Kubernetes clusters? Um, and so that's uh, the sort of stuff that comes from the inner sourcing, right? Um, and then obviously standardization, right? There is no innovation without standardization. The more you standardize, the more time you have to innovate. Um, so all this conversation has created an open culture of understanding, collaboration, and uh, maybe even a little bit of empathy for each other, you know, where a lot of times it was pointing fingers and poking at each other. Um, a lot of empathy now. Um, and additionally, our developers are very much so excited to contribute back to the open source. So we look forward to giving back more, and uh, this was our journey. So that's it. <laughs> Questions? Uh, let's get you a mic so that um, usually somebody's our runner. Check, check. So you mentioned at one point that you use uh, Crossplane, I believe, for some of the infrastructure. Yep. But then you also mentioned that you also use OpenTofu. You said depending on the situation. So can you explain a little bit of you know, how you guys decide what provisioning tool to use for some of the cloud resources? Yeah, that, absolutely. I mean, that's... It, a very common question. And so a lot of our teams are using Open, or open Tofu, Terraform right now. That's what we've known for ages. Um, and so by using Crossplane, it fits more into like the Argo CD um, GitOps lifecycle. And so teams that are more cutting edge, and I'm not going to say cutting edge, but more putting more emphasis into moving toward GitOps, um, that's where we begin to recommend Crossplane. And also being that Crossplane supports a lot of uh, well, pretty much everything that Terraform does, uh, it, it's very interesting to be able to slide it into the GitOps thing. So it's, it's very much team dependent, and uh, we're looking to mature that in, within the organization.
saw earlier you mentioned that you use sharded Argo CD instances. Is that sharded on one control cluster for Argo CD, or do you have Argo CD spread out along all the clusters that you deploy? Uh, yeah, there's one central control cluster that then manages and spreads out to other clusters. We're also using the source namespace stuff as well to keep teams separated um, and keep their projects separated. So. so on that control cluster, you run multiple Argo CDs for the different departments? Or? No, just one Argo CD instance. And it's just HA, like multiple pods? Yes. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit more about your integration with Backstage? and how you kept your infrastructure dis discovered and maintained? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that about the infrastructure keeping it maintained? And Yeah, the discovery piece. How did you get your infrastructure into Backstage and how did you utilize it to Maestro to orchestrate and manage it? So we integrated with like the native Kubernetes integration in Backstage. And so our, when you're referring to the infrastructure, are you referring to how we deployed the infrastructure for Backstage? Or are you referring to how we brought, because we don't keep too, too much infrastructure inside of Backstage just yet. We, we're at the level now where we have our cloud accounts imported. Um, we know who the owners of all of those cloud accounts are. And we're beginning to have um, different things like databases. So if you have a repository like Terraform, um, then you might also be able to create each of those resources as well at the same time. But I mean, that's certainly a good idea for the community as a whole to come together and be able to like read either Terraform or Crossplane and say, OK, well, these are all the actual uh, repositories now. Um, you know or not repositories, but resources, and now augment that with um, your own special blends of spices, right? Um, but yeah, right now we just have multiple Kubernetes clusters imported, and yeah. Thank you. Yep. Got two more. I feel like I want to run, run around and <laughs> give people the mic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, shout it out. Carrots. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no, you, right? So uh, carrots, I'll give a, a good example, right? So we're uh, certainly a GitLab shop, and um, there's different tools that teams want. They say, well, I'd really like to know when I have tons of outdated merge requests and just old, old cruft sitting around. OK, fine. Um, if you onboard your repository into Backstage, then we'll check that for you. And so you have to give them the benefit in order for them to come into the system, right? It, it does take time. Nobody, nobody has somebody just sitting around like, I'm going to hammer out YAML all day. Well, I mean, I'll kind of hammer out YAML all day, right? <laughs> but yeah, um, to what end, right? And, and that's kind of, you have to sell it with the idea and concept that all of this visibility ends up bringing, like, onboarding new developers and reducing cognitive load overall. Um, I, I'd say along with that is just making things easy. Like, in order to limit, if, if you say to someone, hey, here's a benefit, you don't have to do anything. We have it covered. We've already adapted to how you already work. Um, it just you know, limits the amount of naysaying someone can do when you know, we're only providing them the upsides. Yeah. And you might consider generative AI in some way, shape, or form to read like dependencies and different things like that to help you generate those uh, potential links between like libraries and different applications. So just something to think about in your own implementations. Both, both. Um, bottom up, it, there were different different drivers at the top versus different drivers at the bottom, right? Um, engineers, they really were into inner sourcing and working together and uh, discussing the problems, right? Um, whereas, I don't know, what leadership generally would go into the visibility aspects. And so we start doing a lot of different things like showing cloud cost dashboards inside of there, um, being able to show other department metrics, Dora metrics, perhaps, right? And that's where leadership starts, you know, <laughs> getting hungry. Um, so yeah, it's a dual prong approach, bottom up and top down. I'd also say that going through the process of like trying to learn what how each team works. So 
Um, we're going and embedding or like working closely with them to make sure we fit their needs. It just also develops an appreciation for how we're doing things or a discovery on this team is doing it this way. Actually, I kind of like that. Let's try to implement that for everybody else. And us as the central team, we don't know everything. We're not, we don't have the, the best uh, tools or the perfect way of doing stuff. So really collaborating was the main driver between that. You mentioned not having a ton of uh, TypeScript experience uh, when you were first getting started with Backstage. Um, did you find it difficult to get started, and how did you approach learning? It wasn't difficult. It was just different. Um, yeah, front-end, back-end configurations and different things like that. Um, the team that had been working on it was coming from purely Python background, and so it, it, it's just much different. Um, yeah, it, but from an education perspective, it was hands-on and reading a lot of documentation. Lots of docs. Thanks. Just another kind of plug. Please keep contributing to documentation as well. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. It, it, and I think that's one that we're all still struggling with. Um, initially, it was almost like just standard web metrics, like how many unique visitors are we getting per day, per month, right? Um, unique entities. And that's probably not the best measure, more or less. You want to see your times going down, like times to merge requests and pull requests being merged, and just um, onboarding engineers, time to first MR that's merged, right? So yeah, those, uh, that, that's probably where we're going there now, and I think that's a good starting place for everybody. Um, or, just yeah. a very quick question. What size are we talking about here, about how many developers in, the, in these teams? Total we have approximately 200 developers in the organization? 400? 500. I'm being corrected here. I'm being coached. Um, 500. 